Okay, good morning everyone, Boker Tov. Good to see you this morning. Going to uh, continue with our discussion of last week. We got a little bit uh, far afield last week. Not that that surprises anyone. We got a little bit far afield last week by talking about um, the concept of Machal Ben Jerusai. And just to refresh your memories, that was the idea that there is a point in the process of cooking when the food is considered halachically cooked. That's called Machal Ben Drusai. It was named after the uh, robber uh, Ben Drusai. It was named after him uh, and because he was always on the run and he ate his food when it was cooked to the barest minimum. Uh, and that's, that's, the, uh, that's what we call this food. Exactly how cooked is such food? The Shulchan Aruch, the Mishnah Baruch says, either halfway cooked or a third of the way cooked. That's, that's what, at that point, the food is considered halachically cooked. Why was that significant? Well, it came up actually in our Gemara, but Steve mentioned it last week, and it was significant. We turned it into a discussion about Hilcho Shabbos. If you remember, can you put up your cholent right before Shabbos. What's the problem of putting up your cholent right before Shabbos? You remember we discussed this last week. Well, right, what was the problem of putting up your cholent right before Shabbos? So remember, we said that anything that you do, any action that you do pre-Shabbos that continues on Shabbos is not attributed to you. So for instance, if I put up my cholent right before Shabbos, it's going to cook on Shabbos. There's no question that it's going to cook on Shabbos. But that's not considered attributable to me. Why? Because I did everything before Shabbos. I did everything before Shabbos, washed my hands, finished, and now the cholent is continuing to cook over Shabbos. That's not considered attributed to me. So it's not a problem of cooking. What was the potential problem? What was the potential problem? The potential problem was that you might be tempted to speed up the cooking process. Meaning if I don't touch it, I put up my cholent two minutes before Shabbos, right? I put up my cholent two minutes before Shabbos and I don't touch it, it's going to cook. It's going to cook all Friday night. It's going to cook overnight. It's going to cook Shabbos morning. And when I'm ready to eat it, Shabbos day, up, oh, fine completely cooked. None of that cooking is attributed to me because I haven't done anything on Shabbos. I did everything before Shabbos. None of that cooking is attributed to me. Now, here's the interesting question. Let's say that I put up my cholent right before Shabbos and I was planning on eating my cholent Shabbos lunch, but you know what? At about 10 o'clock at night, you know what I decide? I like to see what the cholent tastes like. But wait a second, it's my, maybe it's not cooked. So what am I going to be tempted to do? I might be tempted to stir it up a little bit or to increase the heat a little bit. And as a result of that, because I might be tempted to do that, that's why the Shulchan Aruch says what is preferable is to cook the food at least a third of the way done before Shabbos begins. Meaning, put up my cholent with enough time so that it is at least a third of the way done before Shabbos begins. Right? That is, hang on just a second here, we'll just. Uh, let's see. Okay, that is, that is what the halacha tells us. And it is okay to stir it on Shabbos? It is not okay to no, stir it on Shabbos. If you've done a third before. Even if you, no, if you've done a third before, it's not okay to stir it on Shabbos. What is the reason for that? I, Leslie says, wait a second, it's halachically cooked. Right, so if it's halachically cooked, what's wrong with me stirring it? And the answer is that even though it is technically halachically cooked, you can continue the cooking process. And if you stir it, you continue the cooking process, which, which by the way, brings a very interesting, very interesting halacha. So, and I see this, and I see this, unfortunately, you know, sometimes people don't know this particular halacha. But I have a, hold on a second, I have a cholent cooking in a crock pot. 
and I want to check out my cholent Friday night. So what do I do? Take the lid off of the crock pot. Look at my cholent, say, oh, there's enough water, I don't have to worry. Put the lid back on my crock pot. Guess what? Not permitted to do. Why am I not permitted to do that? Because the minute I put the lid back on, I can take the lid off, but the minute I put the lid back on the crock pot, I am doing an action that will add, hasten the cooking process. So I'm not allowed to do that, number one. Well, I can't problem, number, problem number two, problem number, number two that I'm, that's also complicated, and that is that I am not allowed, if I want to serve cholent, let's say it's Shabbos lunch, I want to serve cholent, so I am not allowed to take the lid off, take my serving spoon, put it in the pot, and take cholent out from the pot while the pot is still in its cooking source. That I'm not allowed to do. And I see that happen, unfortunately, more times than, uh, than I wish. What's the, prob what's the problem? The problem is when I serve food out of the crock pot, it is the same as stirring the food which is in the crock pot. So whatever food will be left in that crock pot is going to be cooked as a result of my serving out that food. It's going, the cooking process is going to be added to as a result of my serving out that food. So if I want to check out the cholent, or if I want to serve cholent Friday night, what do I need to do? I need to lift the pot out of the cooker. While I lift it out of the cooker, I need to have in mind that I intend to return it to the cooker. I can then set it down on the counter. I should ideally still keep one hand on the pot, take off the lid, serve whatever I want to serve, put the lid back on, I'm still holding onto it with one hand, then pick up the pot and put it back into the crock pot. Can you do the same that thing I, that, start, that I can do, hang on a second. We had a couple of questions, I'm coming back to you. Steve, you asked the question before? Yeah, well, you're getting into it deeply into the detail of it about why you're allowed to taste it on Friday night and the how and way the way you're supposed to do it. The way you're supposed to taste it. You, you can okay. taste it, but the way you're supposed to do it. But you're holding on to it does what? So there are there are five conditions. But what what's the prohibition that we're talking about here? The prohibition is placing something back on the covered fire. Right, that the rabbi, there are two prohibitions that were instituted in order to avoid the possibility of cooking on Shabbos. Number one is that the fire, you're not allowed to leave something on an open fire. Now, we all know that. Nobody would leave food on an open fire, you know, when Shabbos begins. What do we put down? Blech. A blech. What is the purpose of a blech? The purpose of a blech is to cover the flame. And this is comparable to what used to be done when they would cover the coals in the, the coals. That was the heat source that they used to cook in those days, in the days of the Gemara. They would cover the coals or they would rake out the coals. So covering the, putting a blech down on top of the fire is the same thing, right? So the fire needs to be covered. That's, that's number one. Number two is that the rabbis prohibited us returning something even to a covered fire unless the following conditions were met. Number one, the food has to be cooked. Number two, the food has to be still warm. Number three, you need to be holding on to it. Number four, you need to have intention to put it back. And number five, the flame needs to be covered. Those are the five conditions that you need to be able to return something to a heat source. Raz. You have to keep your hand on the inside pot to take out or on the outside? On the handle, on the handle. In other words, my crock pot has two handles, right? right. Yeah, so I, I, I take two pot holders. 
I lift the pot out of the cooker, I put it down, and I keep one hand yeah. holding on to the pot. My crock pot is just doesn't have handle. It's as a plastic. Everything's in a plastic bag. No, so, you're that the pla uh, I mean, I don't know what kind of crock pot you have. Most crock well, pots have a cooking element, which is a metal container, a cooking one. element, and then inside the cooking element, there is generally a ceramic pot right there's a generally a ceramic pot so that's that's the kind of crock pots that i'm talking about if you don't have that that's a different story we could talk about that our crock pots are going to set a set of timer to cook for x number of hours <clears throat> and then, and then go. before we serve it it goes on to wall okay and says on wall can i then serve it from the pot you should still not serve it from the pot it's not cooking. It's not cooking. It, it's not. Well, you, you don't know what the temperature of warm is. In other words, <clears throat> my crock pot, or I should say my wife's crock pot, right, has a temperature setting off, high, yeah. low, warm, right? So, it, <clears throat> as, as you know, the temperature is adjustable. So, as a result of that, even if it's low, I still worry that I am aiding the cooking process when doing that. So even, even though that you've turned the crock pot off from cooking, based, I'm saying based on the timer that you've set and it's no longer cooking, we don't know what the temperature, what's the temperature of cooking, what's the temperature of warm, you would sort of need to know those things to be able to understand. Yes. Yeah, interesting. I was at someone's house a number of years ago and they were serving soup. And they said, almost contrary, you don't take it off, you serve it while it's still on the black, you, you dip the ladle in and, and give it to people from... Home. So the only way that they could have done that is if they moved the soup from where it was over the fire. In other words, when we put a blech on, generally the way that a blech works is you have, let's say, four burners, you leave one burner on low, and you put this big metal sheet that covers all of the other burners. So there's one area on, right on top of the flame which is hotter, and then other areas which are not as hot. So there are people who will take the, food, the, the soup from the hot area of the blech and move it over to another area of the blech. That would be, that's considered similar to lifting it off of the blech and putting it on the countertop. But the other area of the blech where you bring it over to has to be less intense than the area where the burner is. And then, you serve it right and then you, you, then you could serve it, then you could serve it right over there. So Steve. All the discussions are involved in a flame. And we, but nowadays when it's say electric flame, No, it's not, a crock pot is not a flame. No, no, but it's, you know, but it's an electric thing that causes heat, right? Right, it's, it's an electric element, right? The, the metal container gets hot. So when you put something inside of an oven that is on the whole time, okay, you, have, you don't have blessed in an oven. So are you, what, what's the question you're asking me? Why can I, why am I allowed to put something in an oven that is on the whole Shabbos and there's no blessed requirement? When are you putting it in the oven? Before Shabbos. Okay, so if you put something in the oven before Shabbos, in other words, think, think about the oven, okay? When you put something in the oven before Shabbos, the oven by definition, the, 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 um, well, not, not, not the racks. In other words, you're saying that there are ovens where the cooking element is exposed. Well, normal, the ones I've seen is underneath. All right, so if it's under, uh, so if it's underneath the bottom, then it's considered covered. But if it's underneath the bottom, then it's considered covered. And you could put something in an oven before Shabbos, and you could leave it in the oven over Shabbos. However, the preferable thing to do is to, you know, once you well, once you open the oven to take the food out, you have to take everything out of the oven. Because once you open the oven, let's say you set the oven at 250 degrees, okay? And you put your food in there and you set it for 250 degrees. And then now you open the door of the oven 
and you take, you, you take one pot out, but you leave one pot in. Your opening the door of that oven is going to trigger the thermostat, and you are going to cause the flame to reignite. And because you are causing the flame to reignite by an action that you did, you are going to be connected to the continued cooking process of whatever is left in the so oven. The same concept would apply if I open a window because I'm too hot and it gets cold air comes in and causes the heat to go up. So, so you are theoretically correct. What's the difference between the oven? What, what's the difference between those two? So let's think about it for a second. What's the temperature in an oven if you set it for 250 degrees? Like who's buried in Grant's tomb? Right? What's the temperature of an oven if you set it for 250 degrees? 250 degrees. What's the temperature in the room? 68 degrees. All right? The differential between the 250 degrees and the 68 degrees in the small kind confines of the oven is much more significant. Right? Let's say my, my, room is, uh, my room is 72 degrees or 74 degrees because it's... it's well, you want, you're opening the window, why? Tell me. Okay, so you're opening the window because it's too hot. So, right, my room is at 74 degrees because my heat is pumping the rooms at 74 degrees. I open the window, the room is now, what's going to happen? The room is going to get cooler. So what are you worried about? Is the, the heat on or is the heat off? Oh, so you're saying, so when I introduce cold air into the room, right. what's going to happen? I'm going to trigger the thermostat. So if I take Steve's question to its logical conclusion, <laughs> I can't leave my house to come to Shul Shabbos morning. Because right. when I open the door, the cold air from the outside is going to come in. And yet, people still come to shul on Shabbos morning. Why? Because it's a very good speech. Right? <laughs> so what's the, reason, what's the reason for this? So again, think about the differential. Right? The differential between the thermostat, which let's say the thermostat is set at 74, and I'm now allowing cold air to come into the room. Right? It's going to take a lot of cold air to come into this room before the, before the thermostat is going to kick off. Remember how thermostats work? You know, thermostats cycle like this, right? You have to go, let's say the thermostat is set to 72. It's not going to go off when the temperature, it's not going to go on when the temperature hits 72, right? The temperature has to hit 70 or 69 before it goes on to bring it up. To, it stays cycled. Thermostat cycle. So the differential between the two temperatures is not as significant as it is in an oven. And the space is not the same as it is in an oven. An oven's a very confined space. When you open the door, you introduce cold air instantaneously into that oven, into a small space, which is going to affect the temperature in that oven. Okay? But in, in the house, I open the window. Yes, I'm going to introduce cold air into the room, but it's going to take probably, I would say, a good five or ten minutes from your opening that window before the thermostat kicks on, if it does kick on even then. And when you go out the door, you're not introducing enough cold air that's going to even cause the thermostat to go on. So you could do those. Those, those things are qualitatively different than opening the door of the oven. Jerry. <laughs> My understanding is that you cannot take a hot shower at Shabbos because of the fact that the water is circulating and will cause the temperature of the light to go on or heat to go on. Am I correct in that aspect, in that statement? Uh, there is a problem if you live in a single family home right, of using hot water on Shabbos. What is the problem of using hot water on Shabbos? So I have in my basement a hot water tank. Okay, I'm old fashioned. I still have a, uh, I don't have an instant hot water, you know, an instant, whatever they call those, tankless hot water tank. I have a tank, right? This big 50 gallon, 75 gallon, 100 gallon tank in my basement. And what happens? That tank is basically a pot on top of a stove. That's what that tank is. 
there's a flame underneath it. And when the temperature of the water goes below a certain, whatever I've set it at, that flame kicks on, the pilot kicks on the flame, the thermostat clicks in and the flame goes and the water gets cooked. We call it the water getting hot, but that means the water is getting cooked. Now, what happens? Every hot water heater has an intake and an output. Hot water works in your home. When you open the faucet in your bathroom or in your kitchen, you pull hot water out of that tank. Why does the hot water go up, right? Your tank is in the basement. Your, your faucet's on the second floor. How do you get water to go up? Water doesn't go up. How do you get, how does it go up? It goes up because the hot water tank maintains a pressure because as you're pulling hot water out, there's cold water or room temperature, whatever, water coming in to maintain the pressure in that tank. If you were to shut off the tank, if you were to shut off the tank, the input, the intake, I wouldn't recommend doing this because you could blow your house up, right? But if you were to shut off the intake of the tank, you'd be able to get some water out, but you wouldn't be able to get a lot of water out because the pressure differential will be, will be uh, destroyed. So now you're using hot water. What's happening? As you're using that hot water, cool water is coming in. Cool water is coming in. It's now going to change the temperature of the water in the hot water heater. That's going to cause the thermostat to go on and you are going to be responsible for cooking, heating up that water on Shabbos. So I Jerry. finished the question. So you, you answered the first part. So my question is, if you live in an apartment house, uh, you know, okay. Apply? All right. So now this is a Kensington Gate question. Yeah, right? Yeah. And, and unfortunately, yeah, Kensington Gate is not... Kensington Gate is not a good example. Why? All right, why? So if I, live in, if I live in an apartment house where the majority of the people who live in that apartment building are not Jewish, so there are opinions that say, in other words, I don't have, I don't have a hot water heater in my apartment, right? There's a hot water heater in the basement of the building that supplies how is the basement? Is that where it is? that supplies hot water to all of the apartments. And there's probably multiple hot water heaters in, in the apartments. Is it a different... Right, so, so, if, so if the majority of people who live in the apartment building are not Jewish, there are those who will allow the use of hot water on Shabbos. Why? Because your contribution to allowing cold... Right, we're not talking about a 50-gallon... We're not talking about a 50 gallon or a 100 gallon tank. How big is the tank in Kensington? It's two tanks, 500 gallons. 500 gallons. So the amount of water that I use, the amount of hot water that I use is not going to cause any change in that tank. However, if the majority of the apartment building is Jewish, which might be the case in Kensington Gate, right? I was being generous. If the majority of the apartment building is Jewish, so then it's problematic. So then it's problematic. There is another way that you can use hot water on Shabbos, but it's not an environmentally conscious way. And what is that? That is that you leave the hot water running before Shabbos. Oh, that's terrible. Right? In other words, <laughs> right? Like Raz said, it's terrible, right? It's certainly not environmentally uh, conscious, but I, I have to confess that sometimes we would do that like to wash dishes Friday night, we would leave right. We would leave the hot water on a little bit, not not you know at full strength, but leave the hot water on a little bit. And since I've done that before Shabbos, whatever is continuing, like I we discussed about other things, whatever is continuing over Shabbos is not attributable to me. And then I could use that uh, I could use that uh, hot water to wash my dishes. When you say continuing, can you raise the volume of that hot water? Once I have the hot water flowing, no, I can't touch it. Once I have the hot water flowing, I can't, I can't change it. Correct. I can't change it. I can shut it off. I can shut it off, but I can't. Rabbi, my understanding is, that is, I have to do some research on this, but the Shabbos oven changes its temperature regardless of opening and closing the door. Okay, so, so, so Robert, 
Robert is discussing something completely um, different, and that is the concept of what's called a Shabbos oven. In other words, you buy many appliances that you buy today, whether they are ovens or whether they are refrigerators, they have what's called a Shabbos mode. That is a misnomer. Shabbos mode is a misnomer. I don't know who created the idea. It's because you cannot, that Shabbos mode is irrelevant when it comes to Shabbos. Shabbos mode is only relevant when it comes to Yom Tov. Right? It's only relevant when it comes to Yom Tov. Because on Yom Tov, you are allowed to raise and lower the temperature. And on Yom Tov, you are allowed to cook. Right? So, so Shabbos mode is only, irrelevant, is only relevant to Yom Tov and not to, and not to Shabbos. Right? The only time where Shabbos mode would be relevant to Shabbos would be if I was leaving, if I had the kind of oven where I left something in the oven before Shabbos, and now when I open the door, what am I, what's going to happen? I'm, no, I'm going to get a little, a little uh, indication that the door is open or else the lights are going to go on. So then the Shabbos mode disables that. That's the only time at which Shabbos when mode would have, be. Let's say a regular oven, if you open a door to, and take out the food, that will set the thermostat just the act alone of Correct. opening up the door and taking the food out on Shabbos. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to do that either. No, you could do it because you, there's, nothing, there, you, there's nothing in there. You're not cooking anything. But you're changing temperatures. And you, you are, you, you are, you get that, right, the flame will you, go back. You are, you are changing temperatures and you might be contributing to the flame going back on yeah. or to the electric element heating up again. But there's no benefit for that. There's no, in other words, your, your food's already out of the oven. Okay. So, Richard. You open up the refrigerator, warms up, goes. Yeah, but a Shabbos refrigerator, uh, from my understanding, is has nothing to do with the temperature. It's, a, it's set randomly. It'll, it'll change the temperature five minutes or ten minutes beyond you opening when you, when you door. put When you put the, when you set your the thermos, when you set Shabbos mode on your refrigerator, so it, you are correct when you set Shabbos mode in your refrigerator, it creates a variable cycle of the thermostat on the refrigerator. Right, and it disables the um, disables the lights. Yeah. Right, and any other indications, sometimes temperature indications, and things like that. Fans, fans, crockpot. You know, you have the lid on the crockpot is it moves around continuously as it heats up. Heat escapes from the right, lid, right, right, and then it goes on again. Right. Just no, but it just moves. It, it's nothing that you're responsible for. In other words, you said it to you said it before Shabbos. So whatever happens on Shabbos, you're not it's not attributed to you if you haven't done anything. Okay. Okay. Let's come back. Let's come. Can you take the thing off out of the crock pot, or the pot? Put it on the side. Hold it. Stir it. And then yes. Put it back in. Yes. Yes. You can. Yes. Okay. So warming drawer. So Fred is asking the question of a warming drawer. What about a warming drawer? So a, a warming drawer, there are different kinds of warming drawers, and a warming drawer is a big debate in halacha as to whether or not you can use a warming drawer on Shabbos because there are warming drawers that are basically little ovens, right? Meaning that uh, they, the temperature changes in the warming drawer. So there are those people who say you can use warming drawers because nobody cooks food in a warming drawer. Right? By definition, what's the purpose of a warming drawer? To keep the food warm. Nobody is going to cook food in a warming drawer. So there are those people who say you can use it. And then those people say you can't use it because when you open the warming drawer, you're going to have the temperature go, the temperature go on. In our community, we have these warming carts um, where there's a constant temperature, where the temperature doesn't change. Whether you open the door, you close the door, it's irrelevant. The temperature is modulated. It stays exactly the same. All right, the electrical resistance stays exactly the same, and therefore, as a result of that, it's not, it's not a problem to use on Shabbos. Okay, back to our question, all right? If you, how did we get into this whole discussion? Bishalakum. What? Bishalakum. Bishalakum, correct. We got into this whole discussion because of Bishalakum, and if you remember the story that we mentioned last week, was the story of the Jew who puts the stake on the coals, and the non-Jew comes along and flips the stake over. What did the Gemara say? The Gemara said, Mutter, it's permissible. 
Obviously, what do you mean? Of course it's permissible. The Jew, is, the Jew cooked the steak, right? The Jew cooked part of the steak. The non-Jew cooked part of the steak. But the Jew cooked the steak at the beginning. So what do you mean? Of course it's permissible. What does the Gemara have to tell me this for? So the Gemara said, no, no, no. This was a special case. What was this case? This was a case where had the non-Jew not turned the steak over, so then the steak would not have cooked, Right? In other words, that was, had the non-Jew not turned the steak over, the steak would not have cooked. Because remember we said the coals were dying and it wasn't enough to cook through. Had the non-Jew not turned the steak over, the steak would not have cooked. Says the Gemara, if that's the case, then it's clearly Bishol Akum. Right? So the first case, I don't know why you're asking. And if you take, this is the case, then it's clearly Bishol Akum. So what does the Gemara say? No. The Gemara says the case is really as follows. The Jew put the, coal on, put the steak on the coals. If nobody would have touched it, so it would have cooked in two hours. Along comes the non-Jew, and the non-Jew flips the steak, and by flipping the steak, what happens? Now the steak cooks in an hour. And those, by the way, those time frames don't work with steaks, but whatever, okay? In other words, by the non-Jew turning over the steak, the non-Jew hastens the cooking process. And since he hastens the cooking process, I might have thought, wow, he's hastening the cooking process. Maybe that makes it into Bishol Akum. Along comes the Gemara to tell me what? No. Even if the non-Jew hastens the cooking process, it does not make it into Bishol Akum. As long as the Jew plays a role in this process, it does not make it into Bisholakum. Then the Gemara went on a tangent with Steve's question. Wait a second. Let's say the Jew, the Jew puts the steak on and, uh, and the non-Jew comes and turns the steak over. And when the non-Jew turned the steak over, it wasn't cooked enough to eat. It wasn't cooked enough to eat. Can't, don't we attribute the entire Bishol process to the non-Jew? And the Gemara said no. This idea of Kamach al ben Drusai, as it appears to be, as, a, as, it, as it applies to Bisholakum, doesn't apply, says the Gemara. Because the classical case of Kamach al ben Drusai would be as follows. Right? If a Jew cooked a food to the point of Mach al ben Drusai, in other words, I took my, I took my, um, my uh, pot roast and I cooked it for an hour. And then I took it out of the oven and I put it in the refrigerator. And then my non-Jewish housekeeper took it out of the oven, out of the refrigerator, and put it back in the oven, back in the oven to fully cook it for another two hours. According to the La Halacha, that would be completely permissible. Why? Because it was already one third of the way cooked. And because the non-Jew put it back on. But let's say, let's say that I put it on the flames, right? I, I put it in, I put it in at 100 degrees to cook. And then after an hour, the non-Jew came along and raised the temperature to 200 degrees or 300 degrees. So that would not be bisholakum. So the idea that what the Gemara is, what the Gemara is telling us here in all of these cases is that even if the non-Jew hastens the cooking process, as long as the cooking process is continuous, and even if the non-Jew finishes the cooking process, as long as the cooking process is continuous and the Jew played a role in that cooking process, it is not considered bishalakum. Seth. Uh, why, why does the halakha make a distinction between a non-Jew doing something and then say an automatic thing in the oven turning on or something like that? Because remember, the, the topic of Bishul Akum is related to a cooking that takes place through the hands of a non-Jew, in which the rabbis prohibited. The reason the rabbis prohibited cooking by a non-Jew is in order to discourage social interaction between Jews and non-Jews. So if I can't eat the food that a non-Jew cooks, so I'm not going over his house for dinner. We're not interacting socially. My, my son and his daughter are not going to be able to look at each other over the table. That was before this takeout. Is, was before, before a lot of things, but yes. This is allowing a non-Jew to take part in, the, in some of the, the 
cooking process. So what we're that's correct. So what to say? What we're, what we're saying is that a non-Jew can take part in the cooking process. Now, there's an interesting piece which is which is important here to understand. We're just discussing from a bishul akum perspective. We're not talking about from a kashrus perspective. What does that mean? I put up I put up my 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 pot roast to cook. And then I leave the house. And the non-Jew continues the cooking process of the pot roast. The non-Jew turns up the temperature. We're not concerned from Bishul Akum, but what are we, yes, concerned about? Kashras. How do I know that the non-Jew hasn't added some non-kosher ingredient into my pot roast, which is cooking? I've solved the problem of Bishul Akum. I put the pot roast up. Put the pot roast in the oven. The pot roast needs to cook for an hour at 200 degrees. And then it needs to cook for another three hours at 300 degrees or whatever. I put the pot roast up. I did the initial action. Bishalakum is off the table. But how do I know that my non-Jew is not adding food which is prohibited to that pot roast? Maybe she tastes the pot roast and she says, you know what, it needs a... Uh, is something else. I'm going to something go to the store and get something and I'll put it in there, which isn't kosher. Maybe it needs some milk, some butter. I don't know. I need, how, do, how do I know about that? A security camera. Uh, so, so basically there are a couple, well, Richard is not so far off. There are a couple of ways of doing this. And this is a big issue. I have a non-Jew in my house. I have a non-Jew who is my, my housekeeper and she's cooking. How do I know that? How can I vouch for her kashras? But you could come in at any time. Ah. So, okay, so, so we, have a, we have an idea when it comes to kashrus, the standard of kashrus, which is if the Jew can come in at any time, in other words, the Jew does not come back. At, I didn't tell, I went out to the store. I didn't tell the non-Jew when I was coming back. I left the house. I didn't tell the non-Jew where I was going or when I was coming back. The non-Jew is fearful that at any moment I might, excuse me, at any moment I might come back into the house and see that she is putting something not kosher in there, she's not going to do it because she doesn't want to lose her job. There's something which is called mirsas. What is mirsas? Mirsas means the non-Jew is afraid of the Jew coming back and catching her or him doing something which is prohibited. Steve. Yes. Why is Bishul Akum today at hotels during Pesach, the cooking of everything, but the, the, guy, the guy in charge puts on the oven? When you make eggs in the morning, what will turn on the, the thing to make the eggs? Okay, so and let's... Is that Bishul Akum? Zero. Okay, so let's so let's look let's look at our Gemara. Is that, I, I understand Bishul Akum is the same as if a, if a guy takes a chicken and puts it in water and boils it. It's the same as cooking it in butter. Okay, that's Bishul Akum. Is that right? I mean, if if, if guy, it's takes, prohibited to me. It's, it's prohibited, prohibited to, to me. you. And as Bishul Akum, what, what what's the connection with turning? Or I the only thing I've ever seen happen in the, with that term is Bishul Akum. A Jew turning on the oven. Is okay. That, is that, that, we're not cooking yet. Okay, so what let's... What we're doing is turning on the oven. Okay, so let's, let's go turn... Look, go to page... Go to page 38B1. Turn to page 38B1. Second line down from the top, 38B1. You have it? Everybody have it? Yeah. What does it say? Ibai Luhu, they ask the question. Hiniach oved kochovim vahafach Yisrael mahu. Right? Let's say the case we spent all this time talking about was a case where the Jew put the stake on the coals and the non-Jew came along and turned it over. What about Fakert? What about if the non-Jew put the stake on the coals and the Jew came along and turned it over? Amar Rav, what does Rav say? Amar Rav Nachem Bar Yitzchak, Kal Vachomer. It's certainly permitted. Gamru biyad ove kochavi mutter 
Gamru biyad Yisrael lo kol shekein. If when the non-Jew finishes the process, it's considered permissible. So if the Jew finishes the process, how much more so does that render the food permissible? Then the Gemara says as follows. Itmar nami, a similar supporting statement is made. Amar Rabba bar barchana, Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Vi Amri lei, Amar Rabbi Acha bar barchana, Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Bein sheheniach oved kochavim v'hafach Yisrael. Bein sheheniach Yisrael v'hafach oved kochavim mutter. Whether the Jew put it on and then the non-Jew finished it, whether the non-Jew put it on and the Jew finished it, mutter, ve'eno aser, and the only time it is prohibited, ad shetehei t'chilaso v'gmaro biyad ove kochavim. And the only time it is, permit, it is pro- prohibited is if from start to finish, it was all done through the non-Jew. We're not there yet. Says the Gemara, Amar Ravina. Ravina says, Hilchasahi. This is the halacha. Rifta, the Shagar Ove Kochavim Va'afa Yisrael. I have an oven. The non Jew turned on the oven. And the Jew cooked in the oven. Inami, or else, Shagar Yisrael. The Jew turned on the oven. Va'afa ove kochavim, and the non-Jew cooked in the oven. We're talking about bread here. Because remember, we're, we haven't learned about it yet, but bread is also, bread of a non-Jew is also prohibited. Inami or shagar ove kochavim, va'afa ove kochavim. The non-Jew turned on the oven, and the non-Jew cooked, baked the bread. Va'asa Yisrael v'chita ba'chitui. And what did the Jew do? The only role that the Jew had was that he came along and he stirred the coals. He stoked the coals a bit. He added a little bit of heat. Shop your dummy, it's permissible. So from this, this is the source that Ashkenazim rely on. This is the source that Ashkenazim rely on, that if the non-Jew turns on the flame, so then there's no problem of Bishul Akko. The non-Jew turns on the flame. So in the days when they used to make ovens with pilot lights, back in the emulgate site, and so, all right, it was not a problem. You had a pilot light. You made sure that you lit the pilot light, and the non-Jew could cook all day long in there, and it wouldn't be a problem to be shalakum. No ovens today have pilot lights, right? So therefore, when the, when the non-Jew turns on the flame, she or he is actually turning on that flame. So you need a Jew to do that. You, you literally need a Jew to do that. And that's, and that's people don't, right? By the way, Bishalakim also applies to children. So if you have your nanny cooking for your children, you have a problem with Bishalakim unless you turn on that flame. Or the child turns on the flame. Or the child turns on the flame. It's a good thing. Teach your children how to turn on the flame on the stove, right? So why, Jerry, go ahead. So why can't you have a situation where based upon what the Gemara said, where a non-Jew does the barbecue, he puts the steak on, and the Jew comes along and just turns it over once. So, Who says you can't have that? So I thought, I thought the whole thing was that the Jew has to be the one that, that turns on the oven, and then you put through, you're finished. Yeah. Okay. If the Jew does anything that contributes to the cooking process, it is considered it is considered not a problem of Bishalakum. Oh, I was told that an Entenmann's, an Entenmann's bakery place, which their ovens are gigantic, the Moshkia comes and puts on the light in the ovens, because the light gives off heat, and they say that's contributing to the cooking, and that's it. Okay, so there, so there are a couple of, uh, Steve is taking us into factory cooking, right? In other words, uh, you know what am I what am I concerned about um, in a in a factory in, in a factory? There's no direct contact between the people who are baking the non-Jews who are baking. It's a commercial production. There's no direct contact between the non-Jews who are baking and the Jews who are eating. 
right? The Jews who are eating don't know who the non-Jews who are baking are. The non-Jews who are baking have no idea who the Jews who are, right? So we take the most lenient opinion there. And the most lenient opinion is if you turn on the light bulb and you introduce a little bit of heat into the oven, right? So then that, so then your Yotzi is on with that, that right? That, that, flies in, that flies in the face of when your maid is there and you don't know what she's going to put in there. No, so that, no, so we're, we obviously we're talking about a place that has hashkacha. Mm-hmm. So what do I do? My, you know, the, my, my maid is, my, my housekeeper is cooking in the house. So how do I know that my housekeeper is not going to, is not going to take something which is not kosher and add it into, uh, into uh, the food that she's cooking, right? And even if you want to tell me, you know what? I only have kosher ingredients in the house. You have kosher ingredients in the house, very nice, but how do you know, you know, basar b'chalav, maybe she, she's, she's adding a little bit of butter, she thinks a little bit of butter would be good, or she's putting a little bit of margarine and she winds up putting the milchik margarine as opposed to the, to the par of margarine. You know, how, how, do you, how do you avoid these things? So we mentioned, Steve mentioned the principle of what's called a yotze v'nichnas. Right, nichnas v'yotze. It's a... It's where, where she never knows when you're going to appear in the kitchen. And if she never knows when you're going to appear in the kitchen, so then that's not an issue. And that's, so for instance, at, uh, at Dunkin' Donuts here in Great Neck. Right, Dunkin' Donuts here in Great Neck. How, how do we know that the worker didn't bring in a ham sandwich from lunch and the worker is eating that ham sandwich, uh, you know, on top of your... Uh, on top of your egg and cheese. I think they're cameras, right? Oh, so there are, there are, Richard mentioned, there's closed circuit cameras that are there. And uh, not that somebody is sitting in the office of the Vada Rabbanim of Queens watching all the time what's going on at Dunkin' Donuts, but the, since the potential is there, the non Jew never knows whether or not somebody's actually watching the feed of this camera, that will be considered enough Mirsas to. Stop him from doing it. But interesting, Mirsas only works by a non-Jew. Mirsas doesn't work by a non-observant Jew. In other words, right? If I have a non-Jew who's cooking, right? If I have a if I have a non-Jew, so then Mirsas can work. Then because because he. But if I have a if I have a non-observant Jew who doesn't care at all about kashras, so Mirsas is. Not, not relevant, which is why many of these restaurants, let's say you have a, you know, you have a, you have a, even a milchik, you have a pizza store, the vad or whatever other supervising agency will require hashkacha to meet this. They'll require somebody who's from working there all of the time. Wait a second, pizza store doesn't need somebody, a mashkiach to midi. You need a mashkiach to midi if there's meat. If there's no meat, you don't need a mashkiach to midi, except because the people who are involved might, might not be religious, so you need to have a religious person there all the time. You can work, but you need to have them there all the time. Jerry. So, I, in case, I know somebody who in Shea Stadium, when they opened up their kosher stands, he had the job, he had the keys, the stand would not open up, the bins would not open up till he came with the keys, and he lit up the ovens, and which he did, and I said, no, what happened? And he said, then I went to watch the ball game until the ball game was over, and we had to close up. So he was never there. He opened, he did what he had to do. He didn't stand there. He left, and he came when they're ready to close up. Why was that? For I would, I, so I don't, know the, I don't know the particulars, but I would have to assume that the workers always suspected that maybe the guy in charge is going to come back. Especially when the Mets will lose it. Right? All you need is the suspicion. All, all you need is that fear that maybe the guy is going to come back. And that fear of maybe the guy is going to come back, it would, would have been sufficient. Also today, like my son has on his phone in camp, he can see wherever he is, every single thing that goes on. Correct, right? Huh? So, so there are those. So there are those who say that that would be a similar thing. In other words, if you had, if you had a camera, but most people don't have cameras in their in their houses, no, right? He has it. He has it in camp, right? He has it in camp. That's a different story. But most people don't have cameras in their kitchen aimed so they can see what no, their right, housekeeper is doing. Or in a business, well, that's what Dunkin' Donuts has. Dunkin' Donuts has a system of closed, you know, of closed circuit cameras that, uh, you know, that uh, that. 
solve the problem of the supervision Not element. Strict, we'll go off that. But much stricter when it comes to wine, which had the same ultimate goal of you don't want to socialize with them, but much stricter with wine and a goy being in any process of it. Because wine, be, because wine had a connection to Avodah Zara. In other words, the only concept by Bishal Akum is the socializing concept. Remember, we learned when we learned this process, we said there were two concerns. One was socializing, and the other was kashras. They pretty much put the kashras aside. We're talking about social. Wine, there's the added element of potentially yayin nesek, stam yena. We'll talk, Imir Tzashem, we'll talk about bread and wine and try to understand. We'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about the process of how this is implemented. I mean, it, basically you understand how it's implemented in restaurants. And, uh, and I guess we'll begin next week with the, do we still, uh, we still have a few minutes, all right? So the idea is why, what's, what's the difference between Ashkenazim and Sephardim here, all right? So Ashkenaz, the, the Shulchan Aruch does not embrace the Halacha the way the Gemara does. The Shulchan Aruch embraces the Halacha that simply for the Jew to stir the coals is not sufficient. It's not sufficient. What do you need? You need to have a Jew who is actively involved in the cooking process. Actively involved in the cooking process. Every hashkacha given by an Ashkenazi organization relies on the position of the Ramah, which is that any adjustment, turning on the flame, shutting it off, turning it back on, anything like that, any adjustment is considered sufficient to void the problem of Bisholakum. I'll give you, a, I'll, just, I'll just give you an example. Uh, here, when we have Cholent, uh, Shabbos, we have Cholent for Kiddush on Shabbos morning. <coughs> so uh, sometimes we get the Cholent from the caterer, which comes up all sealed and it goes into the warmer before Shabbos and then that's the Cholent that goes out. Sometimes the cholent is cooked literally in our kitchen here, in, crack, in a large crock pot. When the cholent is cooked in the kitchen here, so one of the workers puts it in the pot and plugs it in. They don't add the meat because they know adding the meat is a problem. It has to be somebody who's Jewish who adds the meat, who unwraps the meat and adds it, but they start the cooking process with everything else. So now... I go in, or Rabbi Lichter goes in, uh, Friday afternoon to add the meat to the cholent. We pull the plug out of the wall, and then we plug it back in. Why do we do that? To obviate the problem of bisholakum. And then we put the meat into the cholent, and we stir up the meat in the cholent. By stirring up the meat in the cholent, we're making it accessible to the svardim. Right, Because if all we did was unplug it and plug it back in, for the svardim, that wouldn't be sufficient. So we stir up the pot, and then we chain the pot. We chain it. We put a chain and a lock around the pot so that nobody can, nobody's able to lift the lid off of the pot so we don't have a cooking issue, and nobody's able to introduce anything else into the pot. Right? We, we didn't always do it this way, but there was, there was one Shabbos where, where um, I won't tell you who, but uh, many, many years ago, one of the workers here said, <laughs> I tasted the cholent and it needed something and I added it to it, right? From that point on, from that point on, we started so locking and chaining the pot lock. Crockpot lock. Yeah. We started, we started so we doing this. Can you if the cholent's not good? If the cholent's not good, you so can absolume. absolutely blame me. So Svardim so 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 interpret it's not this itself. last part of the Gemara. They don't interpret this last part of the Gemara. It's the Halacha. They interpret the previous part of the Gemara of the Halacha, where the non Jew, where the Jew had to either put it on initially or turn it over if the non Jew put it on. They don't go by the Halacha that says, this last piece here, they don't go by that, which says that it's enough if you just turn the flame so on. Does the caterer no, no, stir the pot mean? also? What? Does the caterer, when he makes chillin', does he stir it up? No, so the caterer does not so, do that, right? Uh, the mashkiach, 
So, so, so then the question becomes, can a Sephardi eat from Ashkenazi Hashkacha? Right? Not from a Kashrus perspective, but from a Bishul Akum perspective. So it's interesting, if you have, in many restaurants, if, this, if a person who's a Sephardi goes in and he says to the Mashkiach, here's my order, but I'm, I'm, you know, I would like you to... So most Mashkiachim are aware of that and they will participate materially in the cooking process. But let's say that doesn't happen. So there's a whole machlokes among poskim as to whether or not a Sephardi can rely on the Ashkenazi leniency when it comes to Bishalakim Iraj. What do you say? No. no. <laughs> is it, but you, 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 it, you say you ate the meat after, you know, in the process after. That's not enough. You have to scour around. Yes. So we do it just to... Uh, we do it just because there are potatoes in there, and just adding the meat is not. But, so, that, but that's not a halakha. That's just. Because well, we're trying to obviate that. We're trying to make it. We're trying to make our children as accessible as possible for everyone. Uh, hey, Jerry, hang on, hang on, Jerry, just a second. Go ahead, Henry. Going backwards a little bit on this question of Sephardim and Ashkenazim, the 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 the, uh, the, the steak that was cooked on one side and then was taken out taken out of the stove put in the refrigerator and left there for whatever time, and then a non-Jew cooked the steak the rest of the, uh, the other side, and it was acceptable as far as Bishul Akum. As long as, as long as the steak was cooked up until the point of Ma'achal ben Drusai right. before it was removed from the flame. A third, right. But would that be acceptable for Sephardim? That would be acceptable for Sephardim, absolutely, yes. Would be. Yes. That would be acceptable for Sephardim. Okay. All right, everyone. Have a great day.